Well, good morning. Good to see each everyone here this morning. I welcome our visitors. We're glad you chose to be with us. Is that really loud or is that just me? Last week we talked about the invitation and we talked about the marriage feast of the parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 22 and how it relates to the church and to all men throughout the world. And we talked about the relation to that in Revelation chapter 19, 7 to 9, that says that the lamb, the marriage of the lamb is ready and that the bride has made herself ready. And we talked about that correlation there in the marriage feast of the lamb or the marriage feast of the, the king's son in Matthew 22, that the lamb is Jesus, the bride is the church. And as there was a card that was passed out last week, and I told you then that the last two items on that card would talk about in greater detail this morning. So this morning's lesson is entitled, Invited, Proper Attire Required, taking our text from Revelation 19 and verse 8. And we'll get there in just a second. I want to kind of remind us about what we talked about last week, about the invitation, and what an honor it is to receive such an invitation. In this sense, in the, in the, the parable that Jesus told about the marriage feast, a king had sent out the invitation, and those who were invited rejected that invitation so that others were brought in. We are invited by that king. And so what are we invited to? When he says, all things are ready, come to the feast, Matthew 22, 1 to 14. The what is the marriage of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 7 to 9. And it is to the church, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, verse 32 of that passage, Paul says he's speaking about the church and Christ and how they're related together. And we talked about who, who is invited. All of mankind. Jesus died for all the world, John 3, 16. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, he says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden. Revelation 22, 17 says, The one that is hungry, the one that thirsts, the one that wants to take of the waters of life without cost, to whosoever will has that right. When? The when of this event only God knows. Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus says, only the Father knows. We see it again in Matthew 25, verse 13, in the parable of the, the ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. The five that were foolish were not ready when the time came. And he says, that's the way it's going to be when time is called no more. Only God knows when. And the where is in heaven. First Peter 1, 4 tells us that reservation for our souls is in heaven. What I wanted us to see from these four things that we can see is that these are in God's control. God is in control of the marriage feast of the Lamb. He is the king. He is the one that this feast is made ready for. He is the one in charge of who is invited. All of mankind are invited. He's the one that knows when it will take place, and he's the one that, that can in control of where. It will happen in heaven in his abode. But the rest of these two things that we're going to talk about this morning is what's in our control. Mankind's response to the invitation is to be properly attired into RSVP. To be properly attired means to wear the fine, bright, and clean linen. Look at me in Revelation 19 and verse 8. That's where we're going to be taking our text at this morning. Revelation 19 and verse 8. To get the full context here, we'll back up to verse 7. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad, and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her. Who's the her? That's the bride. Go back to Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. It says Jesus was going to present her as holy and blameless to the Father. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And we talked about that word bright. The King James uses the word white. And in the Greek it means radiant. It's this word that it exudes radiance. It is shining. So she is to wear fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. It doesn't leave it up to our imagination as to what that bride is to be adorned in. Her adorning, her attire, is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Again, stressing the honor that it is for this invitation. It's the invitation of the king that to all who will come, whosoever will. But there is a reservation. And so we are to reserve a place at the table through obedience to the gospel. That is on us and how we RSVP. We could be like the Jews who chose to reject that honor 
In the parable, he talks about the first people that rejected it. And Jesus, the king says of those people, they were unworthy. He, so he sent his servants into all the highways and byways to bring all that would come into the feast because it was made ready. But there was a caveat. They needed to be prepared. We read in verses 11 through 14 of that passage that as the king came into the ceremony and he saw one that was not properly attired, he was not wearing the wedding clothes. And he had him put out into the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he says, many are called, but few are chosen. It's on us to decide what we'll do with that invitation. Will we reject it? Or will we be the few? Will, will, will we choose to be the chosen? We need to reserve a place at his table through obedience to the gospel. Ephesians 5.23, he is the savior of the body. We must be in the body to be saved. Galatians 3, 26 to 27, we're going to read that in just a minute. Tells us how we get into Christ, how we clothe ourselves with him. And so what we see is that the formal attire that is not optional, it is mandatory, and the RSVP is our response. The way we respond is under our control. And so these are the two things we're going to be focusing on this morning. To be properly attired in RSVP requires obedience to the gospel through baptism. This accomplishes two things. In Galatians 3, 26 to 27 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. It is through baptism that we put on Christ. We clothe ourselves with him. Baptism is this new birth. Not only clothes us with Christ, but places us into the church. In Romans 13, 14, it simply says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people have run with that passage and said, all manner of ways that you're to put him on. Galatians 3, 26, 27 tells us how we do that. We do it through obedience to the gospel. And then there are other things we can look in Colossians 3, 12 to 14, as we did a few months or as we did last month, a few weeks ago. Looking at the things we are to put on, how we attire our hearts. And we're certainly going to talk about that in brief this morning. Because that is truly the way we take on the traits of Christ. By after baptism, we need to continually adorn ourselves with his attributes, with his character. And obeying the gospel through baptism places us into the church. The body of which Jesus Christ himself is the Savior. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, when we're baptized, we're baptized into the body. We can't wish our way into the body. We can't pray ourselves into the body. We are baptized into the body. And it's important to remember Ephesians 5, 23. He is the Savior of the body. No other body will be saved. He has not promised to save any other body. It's important that we are in the church, that we are the bride because this invitation isn't just for us to attend, but to participate. We are the bride who is to make herself ready through the righteous acts of the saints. And we need to also recognize that this attire is not optional. Those who come unprepared are thrown out. And this is an eternal consequence that takes place. In Matthew 22, 11 to 14, But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And you might say, well, earlier in this parable, he says they, they brought in the good and the bad. But they were expected to change, weren't they? There was an expectation here that when they came to the wedding ceremony, they needed to dress appropriately. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. It is important what we adorn our hearts with to be properly attired for this wedding ceremony. This parable about a physical marriage feast also applies to the spiritual invitation as we see in Revelation 19, 7 to 9. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Just in the physical sense, when a wedding feast is a great time of celebration and joy, a time when family can get together and rejoice and celebrate this new life. This is a marriage feast that's going to last for eternity. 
This is a marriage that's going to last for eternity. We're going to, there is great joy. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. When we go back and look in Matthew 22, and we look from verses 1 to 14, we find who is blessed. All men are invited. Everyone was invited. But there are those that rejected. And there are those that try to show up unprepared. And we're told what happens to those who are unprepared. This parable about a physical marriage feast applies to the spiritual invitation, and thus it involves our character. It's not talking about what we physically wear. It says the righteous acts of the saints. What we adorn our hearts with is important. What we think about is important. What is the proper attire for our hearts? Righteousness. Not according to our own idea of what righteousness is, and certainly not according to the righteousness as it is envisioned by the world. Well, what we can read of is what God directs for righteousness. Formal attire is required. As a bride gets ready for the marriage feast by adorning herself in white, the church ought to be preparing itself by wearing the fine and bright linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. And again, you see the bride motif there with the sword because the bride of Christ is a warrior bride. We take on the full armor of God. One thing that we can see when we look in the world around us is that the world is obsessed with physical appearances. But as we've noted before, God judges the heart. God is not really concerned about your outer wear. What he's more concerned about is what's in your heart, what makes up your character. The world is obsessed with physical appearances, though. The world is concerned about what is trendy, what is fashionable. And these things are passing. If you go back and look in times past at what was trendy and fashionable in years past, sometimes what they wore makes us laugh. And I'm sure years down the road, when people look back at what's trendy and fashionable today, will make other people laugh. Right? It changes. It changes on the whim of the people. Today, there are those that practice celebrity worship. They can't wait for the newest magazine to come out and tell them what so-and-so was caught wearing. What did so-and-so wear at some award ceremony? Or what were they wearing out and about? Fashion, cosmetics, surgeries. Fashion of the Stars articles. These are the things we're inundated with. Going and do a checkout at the supermarket, the magazines that are there are trying to catch your eye so that you will buy one of their magazines so you can see what is trendy, what is fashionable, what the stars are wearing. But God doesn't care about any of that. What he cares about is what your heart looks like. It is essential that we know what to adorn our hearts with. Pure character springs forth from the fear of God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14 tells us that. And righteous action starts with the obedience of the gospel through baptism. <clears throat> but the world judges by appearance. That's what the world is focused on. So that's what we're going to talk about in just a second. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. What's happening here is 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 11. Samuel is told by God to go anoint a son of Jesse. And he's not given a name. What we do know is from 1 Samuel 15, when he told Samuel that God had rejected him as king, he said that his neighbor was going to be appointed who was better than him. In 1 Samuel 13, we find he says it's going to go to a man after God's own heart because Saul continually disobeyed God. But Samuel had anointed Saul, and we're told of Saul's stature in 1 Samuel 9, 2. He stood a head and shoulder taller than any other man in Israel, and he was very handsome. And so this might be what Samuel had in mind, this physical stature, when he comes to Jesse's sons. So he comes to Bethlehem, and he says, he tells Jesse to sanctify himself and to gather his sons. There's going to be this sacrificial feast. And so Jesse and his seven sons are there. We can read in 1 Samuel 17, though, in verse 12, Jesse had eight sons, but seven are invited to the feast. And so when tasked with the anointing the next king, he's looking at Eliab, Jesse's firstborn. And he says, surely this is a king. 
But God says, I have rejected him. He says, don't look at his physical stature. Because God does not see as man sees. God judges the heart. He says, do not look at his appearance, 1 Samuel 16, 7, or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Isn't that true today? People will be so quick to judge another you know, person based on their physical looks, their height, their stature, or what they're dressed in. And that's not what God's concerned about. God's concerned about their heart, what's inside. The godly approach is to spend time on an inner appearance. In 1 Peter 3, 3-4, three through 4, Peter is instructing wives. He says it's not a wife's outward appearance that will influence her unbelieving husband as much as her inner life of holiness and submission. And thus the focus is ought, to, ought to be on the inner person adorning the heart. And he says by this, wives will influence their unbelieving or perhaps their unfaithful husbands. Because God judges the heart. In 1 Samuel 6, 12-13, when the eighth son of Jesse is finally invited to the feast and David comes, we're told that he wasn't much to look at. He was a youth. Perhaps the runt of the litter, it says he was he was ruddy. Ruddy can be used to mean handsome. But in this case, talking about his youth, he was he looked he was a young man. And it's this man that God says, This is the one. This is the one that Samuel had foretold to Saul was going to be a man after God's own heart. This is the man who was going to be better than Saul. And he says, You are to anoint him. And so in 1 Samuel 16, 12 to 13, David is anointed king. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Judging the intents and thoughts of the heart, it's able to do that. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, David is the man after God's own heart. And so we need to ask the question, how much time do we spend on our inner self? And do we spend as much time on the inner self as we do on our outer while Samuel was looking at the physical, God was looking at the spiritual. And he was teaching a valuable lesson to Samuel, and not only to him, but for all those who were going to read this later, that God judges the heart. So when he tells us that we need to adorn ourselves as the church, individually as Christians, with the righteous acts of the saints, God's telling us it's not going to be our physical, our outward appearance that he's going to be judging us by. It's what's inside that will make the man or the woman. Now, we know how to adorn ourselves physically. We know that clothing, we have our casual and formal wear. We have our favorites and must-haves. Our hair, we all know how to style our own hair. We have our favorite, we have our favorite look. We might try something new here and there, but we know how to do these things. Cosmetics, jewelry, fragrances. As we talked about a few weeks ago, billions of dollars are spent on these things every year because they're important to people. We know how to adorn ourselves physically. We know what the proper clothing for different occasions are, right? We know how to be somber and reverent and showing respect at a funeral. We know how to show up to a wedding to show reverence and respect and great joy and celebration to the couple that are getting married. We know how to show up to a job interview. We know these things of how to adorn ourselves physically. What we really need to know what is far more essential and more important than any of those things, aspects of our lives, is how to adorn our hearts. How to adorn that inner self with the righteous acts of the saints. Pure character springs from the fear of God, as I said earlier. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13 to 14, reading from the New King James Version, it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Notice he, he didn't say this is the Jews all. He says this is man's all. I mean, this was the duty of all men everywhere. For God will bring about every work in the judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He's telling us why do we need to fear God and keep his commandments? This is man's all. This is our whole duty in life, as the King James says. Because there is a judgment day coming. The things we thought we got away with in secret. The things we thought no one saw. Those things, whether good or evil, will come about and will be made 
non-secret. Pure character will spring forth from the fear of God. And righteous action, righteous action starts with obedience to the gospel through baptism. As we read earlier in Galatians 3, 26 to 27, for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. But that was only the beginning. Every day, we choose what we take with us into the world around us. Not just our, not our physical clothing, but we choose the attitudes and the characters we're going to display to those around us, whether we're at work, whether we're at school, or whether we're at play. What do people around us see? Will they see someone conforming to the image of the world, or will they see someone conforming to the image of the Son of God? Baptism not only clothes us with Christ, but places us into the church, which will be saved. And the church, the bride of Christ, is a warrior bride. Second Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says, he tells Timothy, suffer as a good soldier of Christ with me. Ephesians 5, 22 to 32, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, tells us that we are betrothed to deity. We are betrothed to Christ as Christians. But the saints wear the full armor of God. And just to read a few of these passages from Ephesians 6, the whole context giving the pieces of the armor goes all the way to verse 18, ending with prayer. But I want us to read Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. How should the bride be attired? In the full armor of God. That is part of putting on the righteous acts of the saints. These things will protect us. Notice what he says about this full armor of God. In the Roman language, this would have been called the panoply. Put on the full panoply of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, he's saying it's not flesh and blood, it's spiritual. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Now, when he says take up, he's not meaning pack it in the bag and carry it with you so that when the moment of need arises, you have it. Notice what he said back in verse 11, put on the full armor of God. So when he says take up the full armor of God, he's meaning you better be wearing it. Everywhere you go, you need to be wearing the full armor of God so that when these things happen, you'll be able to stand. You'll be able to resist the devil when that time comes because we don't know when those temptations are going to strike. We don't know when we're going to need faith as a shield in front of us. We don't know when the opportunity is going to arise and someone's going to tell us something that sounds good but different. And that truth wrapped around our core needs to come into play so that we can tell the difference between truth and error. We need to be properly adorned. And one of the ways that we properly adorn ourselves is wearing the full armor of God. And the saints' manner of life adorns doctrine. In our class this morning, Chuck was reminding us how many times the word doctrine is used through the epistle of 1 Timothy. And in the epistle, if we combine Titus with that, both Paul was concerned that these young preachers, Timothy and Titus, would be concerned about standing firm in faithful or sound words and doctrine. In uh, Titus chapter 2, 9 to 10. He says, Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. Here he's talking about those Christians who were slaves in the first century. He says they needed to adorn themselves with the doctrine of God. One of the ways we do that is truth at our core. Because we'll know the difference between truth and error. That's part of putting on the full armor of God. We need to put on the doctrine or the teaching of Christ. We need to put on or wear the doctrine of God. Our manner of life must be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Look with me in Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. It says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, 
so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I'll hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit and with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. As we just read in Ephesians chapter 6, what do we need to be wearing that we could be standing firm in one spirit? Why did he say put on the whole armor of God? He says so that in the, when the evil day comes, you can stand firm. We need to put on the full armor of God. We need to adorn ourselves with the doctrine of the teaching of Christ. And in that way, we walk in a worthy manner of the gospel of Christ. This conduct is our behavior. Or the, New King, or the King James uses the word conversation. It's how we speak and act. It's how others interact with us. As others interact with us, are we walking, are we conducting ourselves worthy of the gospel by which we are called? In Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14, goes on to tell us that we need to deny ungodliness, deny worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Peter is going to tell us here in 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 to 11, how to properly adorn our hearts. We spent some time a few weeks ago looking in Colossians 3, 12 to 14, and some of those things that we studied then are going to overlap here. But I wanted us to focus in on this passage, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 11. And notice the importance of these things he tells us we need to have as our characters, why they're not optional. Notice what he says about them. He says in verse 5, Now for this very reason also applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, in your godliness brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. And we're talking about an invitation. The invitation of the King, the Creator of heaven and earth, has invited us into this marriage supper of the Lamb and has invited us to live with him for eternity. For eternity, He says, these things are important. Moral excellence is described as virtue. That's the determination to do what's right. We can see an example of this in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8 where we read Daniel as a young man made up his mind to do what was right before God. No matter what the king's invitation was, there was an invitation too. Come into the school for three years. Eat at the king's own table. Eat the food and the wine served before the king. And Daniel says he made up his mind to serve God. And they made a difference. He and his three friends with him. They said, put us on something else. We will not eat the king's food and we will not drink the king's wine. We will not defile ourselves because it was against God's law. And they made up their mind to do so. That is what moral excellence is. That is what virtue is. That's the determination to do what is right. And knowledge, knowledge of the word of God. In it is righteousness, Romans 1, 16 to 17. And self-control, the application of the knowledge that you read, the knowledge of God's word, the application of that is self-control, abstaining from certain things, putting certain things on. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, Paul said he had to discipline himself daily lest he be disqualified after preaching to others. Perseverance, remaining steadfast to the Lord and to his cause. Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. The Hebrew writer says, now is not the time to throw away your confidence, even though they were suffering greatly. He says, great is your reward. Now is the time you need perseverance so that you don't shrink back, but you have the, that saving faith and godliness. That is to be like God. To be as he would have you to be. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says, Lay aside the old self, put on the new self. Colossians 3, 9 to 10, very similar language. Laying aside the old self, putting on the new self. And we are to put on brotherly kindness. That is tender affection toward brethren. We read of this in Colossians 3, 12 to 14, when we're told to put on compassion, to put on love. Love is that devotion to God, to Christ, and to fellow man. 
Love is the way the world is going to see us and know that we're His disciples. We need to put on love. Colossians 3, 12 and 14, in fact, says, put on compassion. Then it says in verse 14, put on love. These things allow us to forgive one another. Peter tells us love covers a multitude of sins. If we have not adorned our heart with love, we won't have tender affection for one another. We won't have that attitude ready to forgive. We won't have compassion for those who need it. We need to put on these characteristics. In fact, going back to what we read, he says, when you put these characteristics on, when they are yours, you're not fruitless. You are fruitful. And the entrance to the eternal kingdom is abundantly supplied to you. You're more than invited. You are a participant. Peter tells us how to adorn our hearts and our character with the righteous acts of the saints by adorning our heart with these things. Adorning our hearts with the required wedding attire is essential to entering into heaven. It's part of accepting that invitation that has been made that we come to the wedding feast prepared. Why? Because it says the bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to wear clean linen, bright and fine, the righteous acts of the saints. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 3, Paul wrote of the Corinthians, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Paul is reminding saints that they are betrothed to deity. There is a higher calling than that we must walk with. We must be presented to him as a pure virgin. Not be deceived and led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Because Christ will present to himself the church as holy and blameless. Ephesians 5, 26-27 that we read last time. He will present her to himself holy and blameless. And if we are not properly adorned, there's no mystery as to what will happen to us if we show up unprepared. In that parable, he says, he was cast out into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want you to see, and we're not going to have time to look every one of these up. I have it on the slide for your perusal. But there is a great emphasis placed on white garments throughout the New Testament, spiritually symbolic of purity. In Revelation 3, 4 through 5, some in the church at Sardis were still white and unsoiled. But this was in contrast to those who were wicked. Revelation 6, 9 to 11, martyrs are clothed in white robes. Revelation 7, 9 to 17, those who overcome the world will be clothed in white and will be in the presence of God. Revelation 19, 8, the proper attire for the bride of Christ is fine linen, bright and clean. And it's white in the King James. Bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And Revelation 19, 11 to 16, Christ is depicted here as the conqueror on his white horse, followed by his army of saints in white robes on white horses. Just as Jesus used the imagery between light and darkness to contrast those who are righteous and those who are wicked, find the bright robes signify those who are going to be in the presence of God. And he says that's what the bride, the church, is to adorn herself in. Our eternity with God Almighty then is dependent on how we adorn our hearts with the required attire for the wedding feast of the Lamb. Revelation 19.8 says the, Lamb, the bride has made herself ready. The feast is ready. Ephesians 5.26-27 describes it, describes the bride as being holy and blameless. 2 Corinthians 11.2 describes saints as betrothed to deity, to Christ. And Matthew 22.11-14 places the emphasis that we need to be prepared when we come to that wedding feast. The invitation has been sent out. But remember, we're not only the invited. We are the bride. As saints, as the church, we are the bride of Christ. And so my admonition and encouragement this morning is let us be ready to attend properly attired in fine linen, bright and clean, having our hearts adorned with the righteous acts of the saints. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be. That invitation is extended for you as well. That invitation is to you that it starts by putting on the Lord in baptism, clothing yourself with him, 
And in a, a lifetime, putting those characteristics to application in your life. And if you are a Christian this morning, not living the way you should, perhaps not properly attired and ready for that time, now's the time to make it ready. Now's the time to be prepared. And if we can assist you in any of these things, if you're subject to invitation in any way, come forward and let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.